Good evening and welcome to q and I'm Tony Jones here to answer your questions tonight. The Chief Executive of Melbourne University Press, Louise Adler. Minister for Energy and Environment, Josh Frydenberg. Actor and activist, Sharina Clanton. Simon Brini from the Institute of Public Affairs. And Shadow Treasurer, Chris Bowen. Please welcome our panel. Our Q&A is live in Eastern Australia on ABC TV and live on iView and News Radio at 9.35 Eastern Daylight Saving Time. And you can stream us on YouTube, Facebook and Periscope. Well, our first question tonight comes from Dylan Hopcroft. Hi, good evening, and this is my question. With such a high rate of marriages in Australia failing, where does the Prime Minister get the righteous moral authority to humiliate one man, Barnaby Joyce, in front of the nation? Where's the decency in that? Louise Adler, we'll start with you. I knew this would happen. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Um, I couldn't agree with you more. I thought it was an extraordinary performance by the Prime Minister, of acting as the moral arbiter-in-chief of, um, of the community. I thought it was rather extraordinary, as you rightly say. I think it's over 40% of marriages fail in Australia. Mm. I think these are private matters. I feel for Barnaby. I feel for his family, his wife, his new partner. I think it's a very difficult matter and I think it should have been left in the private realm. And I think it's a rather extraordinary moment for the media to consider whether we have now crossed a line where politicians' private lives are actually the matter of public scrutiny and public debate. Oh, now, do so you think, thought... in this case, do you think the media forced Malcolm Turnbull's hand? Murray Darling Basin Plan and um, the opposition to vaccinating young women against cervical cancer and um, his um, uh, 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 proselytising for the sanctity of marriage during the marriage equality debate. I thought of all those positions myself personally were wrong and in, in, incorrect. I thought he should have stayed out of the bedrooms of the nation. But in this instance, I think we should stay out of his bedroom. Josh Frydenberg. Well, it's not about the issue of people's marriages breaking up because that is a very sad fact in society. But what the Prime Minister has done is he set a new ministerial standard of conduct. And that conduct relates to whether you are married or whether you are not. Mm -hmm. And he expects his ministers not to have a sexual relationship with their staff. Josh, um, I think the well, public Josh, I'm just, to just going to interrupt you just for a moment. We will come to the new standard. There's a specific question on it. This is about... Malcolm Turnbull's moral stand he took here. Uh, do you back him completely on this moral stand, this set of values that he's enumerated, not only for the ministry, but it seems for the nation? I absolutely support him. Uh, he is somebody who's obviously uh, been in a long, successful marriage with his wife and he's lived those values that he has articulated. Now, of course, uh, there are lots of people who are in bad marriages. There are a lot of marriages that break up and no one is passing judgment on them. But I think what he was saying is that he expects the leadership of this country from himself down to reflect a standard which was not the case with Barnaby Sinclair. Hasn't he effectively told Barnaby Joyce and the National Party he can no longer work with him as Deputy Prime Minister? Not at all. And the fact is that we are two different parties and Malcolm Turnbull and Barnaby Joyce understand that. The two parties have been the most successful political partnership in Australia in the 95 years that we have been together. In fact, we've been in government more, longer together than any other political party. Uh, and we will not, as a Liberal government, be telling the Nationals who their leader should be. That is a matter for them. The fact that the Prime Minister and the Deputy Prime Minister got together on Saturday, it probably was an uneasy conversation. They, they, they've said publicly it was frank, yet it was warm. I think that would have been an opportunity to clear the air and we can work together. Quick question for you personally. Do you think Barnaby Joyce should resign? Well, Barnaby's political future is a matter for him and the National What's Party. What's your personal opinion? Well, it's not for me, Tony, with the greatest respect, to have a personal view because I don't sit in the party room. What I did do, though, is today in Brisbane, I did my own pub test. I went out and I met some people at the front bar and they, of course, would have, they like to talk about sex bans more than tax codes, but what they did say, what they did say is we want you governing for the nation. We're interested in jobs, we're interested in health, we're interested in education and we're interested in energy. So I think once this issue subsides, and it may take some time, uh, I do think we will get on with the business of governing where the public expects us to. And Barnaby okay, we're Joyce, going to come, going to come to all those issues in a minute. Uh, Chris Bowen. 
Well, thanks for your question, Dylan. It was an extraordinary press conference by the Prime Minister. Uh, and what the Prime Minister did was attack his deputy for things that the Labor Party certainly hasn't attacked him over. I mean, we have a lot of criticisms of Barnaby Joyce, and I'm happy to run through them. And I do think he should resign. Mm. But not because he had an affair. And that, frankly, is none of my business and none of anybody's business. That's a matter between him and his family. It's a very difficult situation. And in terms of his personal life, we wish him and his family nothing but the best and hope that they come through the other side uh, you know, as best as you can in this circumstance. What we're critical of Barnaby Joyce uh, for is, is, apart from his policies, but in this particular instance, living rent-free without declaring it. Yeah. I mean, that, that is a... Mate, that, to talk about the Code of Conduct, that's a breach of the Code of Conduct. You don't need to change the Code of Conduct. The Deputy Prime Minister has breached it and breached the rules of Parliament. He should resign for that alone, uh, but not the sort of, as you put it, moralising by the Prime Minister. That, that's a matter for him and he's got to account to his family for that and it's frankly not something that we should be traversing because, as you say, who sits in judgement on other people's personal lives? Only, we, only he can know what, it, what the circumstances are, his wife can, can judge that, but we can't. What we can hold him account for is his, his failure of accountability to the parliament. I mean, Sam Dastiari had to resign from the front bench for accepting a gift of, 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 to pay for a personal bill and he fully declared it. Barnaby Joyce has accepted free rent and hasn't declared it. That's not true. Well, if you think that's a declaration, no, that you have a different... De uh, the, nobody could look at his declaration and say, oh, he's got rent-free from Michael Maguire. Chris, that's just not the case. you know of. that when he was offered that accommodation, he wasn't a Member of Parliament, and when he became a Member of Parliament, after the by-election, he declared... No, he didn't, Josh. He, he did. He, where does it say, I got free rent he from him? It he doesn't say it. that. It says residual of six months' tenancy. I'm sorry, Josh, that is not a declaration. Now, with the greatest respect, you have just said that we shouldn't be moralising about people's relationships. Well, today, your leader has accepted the Prime Minister's leadership and said that you will now subscribe to these new ministerial what we've said, what, what, what Bill Shorten has said is he does not think that's the main game. He's not proposing to change it if he becomes Prime Minister. But, Josh, you know, you shouldn't need a rule book if you get into Cabinet to tell you what's, uh, what's right and wrong or dumb. OK, right? I'm going to pause that... the politicians for a minute. I want to hear from the other panellists. Sharina. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's conducted himself um, adequately as a Prime Minister. This is one of the very rare occasions that I might agree with Malcolm Turnbull, um, <clears throat> based upon my own individual stances. Um, I, in this instance, in terms of answering your question, I think in, I agree with Chris that you shouldn't have to have a rule book to have some semblance of restraint in your cabinet. And you should know that it's uh, gross misconduct to sleep with any member of parliament. And that should, that should be across the board. And the fact that we've had a member of parliament having sexual relations with one of his female cabinet members is absolutely open to discrepancy, open to discussion. Staff members. And yeah. staff been... members yeah. and um, open to debate. And the fact that Malcolm Turnbull has had a serious dressing down regarding this issue, I think um, I couldn't agree with him more. Simon. Um, look, you know, Barnaby Joyce, as Chris has said, um, has made a mistake and he's made a mistake that he'll live with for the rest of his life. I don't think that it necessarily helped for Malcolm Turnbull to moralise on the issue. I think that there are much, much bigger issues that the Prime Minister should be concerned with. And, um, you know, if we're completely frank about it, Malcolm Turnbull knew about this for a long time before he got up mm. uh, earlier this week and, and said what he did about Barnaby Joyce. So um, I, I think, you know, unfortunately for Malcolm, he was in a very difficult position where the pu private life of one of his cabinet ministers and the deputy prime minister was splashed across the front pages of the paper. I think the expectation on the part of a lot of Australians is that the prime minister sends some signals about whether he thinks that that kind of behaviour is appropriate. Um, but unfortunately, I think Malcolm's put himself in a position where he looks a little bit hypocritical, given that he has known about this for some months now um, and hadn't taken steps to rectify the situation prior to um, this story breaking in the media. I'll quickly go to our next question. It's on the same subject. It's from uh, Rachel Hollick. Um, OK, so basically it has been said that government regulation um, is a symptom of a greater distrust within the society. As such, if these new regulations with regard to sex with ministerial staffers are a sign of the greater distrust within politi like with politics and politicians, 
um, then how would you suggest um, we actually solve this problem without government regulation? Simon, I'll start with you because you're famously against government regulation or a <laughs> surfeit of it. What do you think about this one? Yeah, um, I mean, look, I, I think there's a, there's a slight distinction between codes of conduct in a workplace, which is essentially what the code of conduct is for ministers and government regulation more generally. But on the ministerial code, I thought it was a um, creepy... Uh, unenforceable um, intrusion into into um, the private lives of consenting adults, and um, I, I think that th th there's a very strong norm in place, and most people would see this as a matter of of um, a quite obvious rule that you would abide by, whether there's something written down in black and white or not. Um, but it, there are going to be some cases where um, it, it's not. It's, it's not a, an immoral thing to do. So once upon a time there would have been ministers who had, for instance, their wife or their husband working in their electorate office. Now, mm -hmm. clearly people aren't saying, well, that is immoral. So there are obvious exceptions to these norms. Um, but in most cases, I think people have the decency and the common sense to recognise when this kind of conduct is OK and when it's not. And I think, unfortunately, the situation that we're in at the moment is that across the community, there's a breakdown in these norms. For, for whatever reason, there's a much, much bigger discussion we can get into about why that's the case. But one of the reasons why I think we find ourselves in the position that we're in at the moment is because those norms have broken down. And I think one of the things that is really important that we should be saying to people to come out of all of this is, you are responsible for your own life. You are responsible for the decisions that you make. And it's only you who can fix the situation that, for instance, Barnaby is in. Barnaby is the only one that can fix that, that problem that he's created for himself. Um, everyone has to take personal responsibility and I think that's what, what really lies at the heart of, of these issues. People failing to take accountability and, and to be accountable for, for decisions they make in their own lives. And that comes back then to the broader issue of government regulation. Now, I think really what, what government regulation is seeking to do and what it displaces is that idea of, of individual autonomy, that idea of personal responsibility. Louise Adler. Well, um, I'm shocked to find myself sort of agreeing with someone from the IPA, so um, <laughs> let me recover so for shocked. a moment Don't just so briefly. I'm so sensible, shocked. Pretty I'm sensible so mainstream well, people. Uh, <laughs> we can <laughs> talk about that another time. <laughs> <laughs> to break that time. But I do think there's an issue here about um, assume most people meet their partners. We work long hours, most of us. Where do we meet our partners, our future partners? Where do we have relationships, friendships, partnerships, loves, whatever drama, emotional connection? We have them in the workplace. To imagine that the hot house. I mean, you two, you know, um, you know, um, Josh and. Chris, you know it better than I do, the hot house that is Parliament, the fact that you work long hours, the fact you're away from your families for weeks and weeks on end. I mean, is it surprising that there's what's quaintly known as horizontal folk dancing going on <laughs> in Parliament House? You know, I'm not surprised. <laughs> so I think we without say... Without music, yeah. Without music. <laughs> or, uh, well, I, uh, 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 we have That's to feel bad. sorry for Josh. He has no music to it. To go. <laughs> <laughs> My wife is watching. Oh, no. And I'm sorry for your wife. She seems no, no. like a lovely girl. She is. Um, however, um, it seems to me that, you know, that's the feverish and fettered environment in which you all work. I feel for you. But I think that we know that people have professional relationships in their workplaces. When those relationships become intense and private and emotionally engaged, then they move on. And I'm, you know, I don't know the ins and outs of Barnaby Joyce's relationship with Vicky Campion, is that her name? Um, I understand that she then moved to another office and then to another office. Well, isn't that in any other workplace, ordinary workplace, professional conduct? You develop a relationship and you say, well, it'd be conf there are conflicts of interest which we need to manage. We need to be transparent about this. We need to part ways. My, you know, old feminist um, uh, instincts is that it's often the women that get displaced. It's the, often the women that have to move out while men who are in positions of power stay where they are. But that's a sort of side issue. It seems to me that these are about professional working relationships and how you manage them. And it's no surprise that there'd be, you know, romances and why, you know, marriages condu conducted and babies being bred in Parliament House. It doesn't seem to me to be very surprising at all. Josh, um, <laughs> it's, it's time for that famous straight bat of yours. <laughs> try, Josh, try. Yeah, no, I do feel like the Night Watchman tonight. Um, but, uh, look, the Prime Minister was setting a standard which was seeking to be preventative yeah. in the sense that he was setting an expectation of his ministers which he wasn't expecting them to breach but to follow and I think that's the point. There has been a culture that has been lacking in Canberra. It's well known to everyone that mm. this is not the first instance of such a situation. And I think that we 
uh, can do better. And the fact that the poll today showed that the people expected us to do better and supported that move by the Prime Minister in itself was telling. If this was a woman, flip the script, reframe the narrative for a second. If I don't Barnaby, really want to really wanna... think about Barnaby. No, I don't. I don't either. <laughs> I'm with you then, Tony. Oh, okay. But if this was a woman, what do you think the fallout would be? What would the repercussions be? If this was a, perhaps a man who identified as LGBTQI, what would the, what would the accountability of these actions be? They'd lose their job instantly. Mm. So why are we making excuses for Barnaby Joyce? OK, we have a question on that subject. Before that, I just want to hear from uh, Chris Barn because um, it has been said that the, the Bill Shorten will keep the ban if you get into government. So yeah. you must think it's a good thing. Well, what we've said is that we don't think this is the main game. We think this is a bit of a distraction from those other issues which we think are the uh, answers that Barnaby Joyce has to provide. But, but you agree with the ban? We, we, we won't change the ban. It's, it's fine. Um, but I do think over time, uh, I think Louise um, uh, alluded to this, there is a power relationship in any office, but particularly in a political office. A minister is a very senior, powerful person and there's a power imbalance. Mm -hmm. um, with, his, with his or her staff and with his or her department. And so we need to be ensuring that we're moving towards, whether it's a formal code of conduct or um, procedures that are best practice for the workforce, for the workplace, particularly in the minister's office, so that everybody's treated with respect. Nobody feels that there is any intimidation in any regard um, to do anything that they don't want to outside their proper work requirements. Now, that is partly a matter of a code, but it's also a matter of culture, frankly. You can, you can write all the codes you want. It's about values and culture in a workplace, uh, much more importantly than any written down set of rules. And that's why I say you shouldn't actually need a rule book, but I do accept that you need, you, of course you need a framework. Uh, but right around the world, of course, this is, this is an issue. Um, and there have been big steps forward just even in recent weeks. And I do think from our point of view as, as the alternative government, we'll be looking at best practice so that all the people who work directly or indirectly for a minister uh, feel that they have full freedom and are not intimidated in any way. Of course, a minister will give instructions. That's a minister's job, but they've got to be appropriate and people need to be treated with respect. OK, we'll move on to uh, what will be our final question on this subject from uh, Aaron Underwood. It started with Bronwyn Bishop's Choppergate. Then we had dual citizenship. And now we have Barnaby Joyce. It seems like a toxic culture of denial seems to be flourishing in Canberra. Now, my question to the panel is, do you believe that it is time that political figures accept that when standards of professional conduct are broken, it will mean the loss of public confidence and it will mean the ending of a political career? Shereen, I'll start with the non-politician, so I'll start with you. Oh, God. <laughs> um, <clears throat> you know, the systems that are in place in this government, I don't hold a lot of faith to. The power structures that exist, the uh, policies and procedures around the power structures and authoritarians, powers that still are very much implemented and embedded in our daily existence, I have lost faith in, in uh, many occasion. Um, it, it is a shambles. It has been a shambles for a very long time. There are people behind the scenes that are, are fighting the good fight. Um, I, I think that uh, some of our politicians perhaps are peddling one's own agenda rather than engaging with community on a grassroots level, rather than being the spokesperson for, for you know, what they've been elected into the parliamentary position for. And I think in Bronwyn Bishop's case, in the abuse of her uh, funds, in the abuse of the power structures that exist, they still, they're implemented, they're benefiting the, a particular elite. And they, not, they don't benefit you and I. They still get a cushiony uh, retirement fund. They are still um, not having a ripple effect in terms of the fallout and consequences to their actions. There's still a lot of conversation and dialogue about the actions that do take place without any after, aftermath whatsoever. So I don't know the answer to your question. I don't know 
how you instill faith, especially as a Australian Aboriginal woman, in light of the Closing the Gap initiative, in light of the, in light of the statistics that have come out, and in many of the multifaceted layers in my communities, I, I don't know what that solution looks like. And I don't know how you then uh, deconstruct the archaic narratives that exist so that people like the Bronwyn Bishops and the Barnaby Joyces stay in those positions of power. I don't know, I don't know what the solution to that is. But they need to be challenged. They need to be accountable. And they also need to no longer be a voice for who, for us, the voiceless. Louise, what do you, what do you think? I mean, the, the essential, uh, well, the end of that question was, do you have to go if you're in a position like Barnaby Joyce? I don't know about Barnaby Joyce. I, you know, again, I have no, you know, understand. Well, I have no understanding of the National Party. It's not a party that, you know. Um, <laughs> um, yes, let's leave it like that. Um, <laughs> um, but you know, I have no uh, affiliation or um, understanding of the nature of that party, so I can't judge whether he should go or not. But I think underneath your question is that question about the disenchantment we feel as citizens mm. with our parliamentary, our political representatives. And I share your disenchantment, I share your kind of um, disheartenment and your disillusionment, and yet I think we have to really believe that parliamentary po politics matters and that we can... We can and through these good people, and I do believe they're good people, and I do believe they're in the business of public service, that it actually matters. I watched the Bob Hawke documentary last night, the second part of it, and I thought, you know, this was whatever your political stripes are, this is a story of insp an inspiring story of courage and political vision, not just by Hawke himself, mm. but that entire Labor government mm. and the vision and the reforming agenda and the way in which they set about shaping a modern Australia, mm. whatever your political views are. And I think I have to believe that these characters, whatever their political convictions are, want to achieve something of that sort here, that they're in the business of making a difference and that they have our best interests at heart and that we need to charge them and empower them to actually get about the business of reformation and reform and changing modern Australia and improving it from the Closing the Gap yes, initiative yes. through to our treatment of refugees. So there's a whole yes, battery yes. of issues that we could confront. But I have to believe that parliamentary politics matters and we as citizens, I think, have to believe in it and we have to empower <clears throat> and burden these two guys with that obligation, that they're there for us, they're not there for themselves. But it's about... Yes, yes. Hang on, Simon. Uh, well, Aaron, uh, lucky for you and for all of us, there's this wonderful accountability mechanism that's in place called democracy and that allows for people who are unhappy with their current member of parliament to vote them out. And um, it's been really interesting, I think, watching what has happened in New England over the last few days. There have been various newspapers who've covered views from people sitting at the front bars in anecdotal pieces of evidence and also they've done polls. Um, to see whether or not people's views about Barnaby Joyce have changed. Um, and I think, it's, I, I think that's the, the best accountability mechanism that you could possibly put in place. Um, you also raised, of course, uh, an, another example uh, in New South Wales of a Liberal uh, Member of Parliament who was no longer a Liberal Member of Parliament after the federal election last year because she was voted out in a pre-selection which took place within a political party. So there's a number of these checks along the way that mean that this sort of behaviour, if your reputation becomes trash, then it's a, a, at a certain point you'll get picked up. And I think that that reputational risk that politicians mm -hmm. have is something that is, is alive for them every single day because they're under so much public scrutiny. Um, we'll get a brief response from both the politicians. And uh, Chris Bowen, I mean, it's all a news poll today. Uh, obviously, this is having some overall effect. Is it a permanent effect? Well, uh, Aaron, thanks for the question. I think that I agree with you, basically. Um, it's pretty hard to argue with the way you put it. Of course, these scandals have an impact on public trust. Let me make two brief points. Firstly, I think that almost every MP I can think of is in it for the right reasons, of all parties. I mean, it's, they work hard. I have a very different uh, view about the future of Australia to Josh, but he's in it for the right reasons. Um, uh, he's in it for, for good per public policy purpose and public service. And uh, the vast majority of MPs are on, on all sides. And that sometimes get lost, gets lost, understandably, when we have these scandals. The other point I'd make is that that's part of the reason why we've announced a National Integrity, Integrity Commission, because of that loss of trust, a federal ICAC. We announced it in January, partly because we think it's best practice public policy, but also because we recognise that there's a trust problem and bringing in a National Integrity Commission is part of the answer to try and get that trust back. Uh, Josh. 
Well, politicians are rightly subject to more accountability and scrutiny than any other uh, facet of, uh, of workplaces and, and, and life that you see in other sectors of the economy. I mean, every trip we take in a car, every hotel we stay in, um, every day we're away from our families, that is on the public record. Uh, and so it should be, because there is a higher um, standard. Now, obviously, after the Bronwyn Bishop issue, we may, and, and subsequent issues to that, we made some significant changes that the Prime Minister led on in relation to parliamentary entitlements. Um, the, again, all that information is out there for people to see, but nobody wins, either in the public or in the parliamentary process, from that loss of faith. And so we've all got a stake in improving um, the position in which we currently find ourselves in. OK, remember, if you hear any doubtful claims on Q&A, let us know on Twitter. Keep an eye on the RMIT ABC Fact Check and the Conversation website for the results. And the next question, I should say, we got more questions on other issues, including electricity policy, than we did on Barnaby Joyce. So <laughs> let's go to issues that do concern a lot of people. This one comes from Andrew McCauley. Hello. I represent the print and packaging sectors, which, with the demise of the car industry in Australia, is the largest manufacturing employer in the country. These employers are in urban and regional Australia, um, and they're predominantly SMEs. The, the skyrocketing cost of energy is, is crippling manufacturing in this country. The government has initiated the NEG, which hypothetically will perhaps provide some reductions or relief on energy costs in up to three years. My question is, to you, Josh, and to Chris, what will the government do to provide immediate relief to industry to keep skilled jobs in Australia and keep manufacturing industry in Australia as a government and as an opposition? Josh Rodenberg. Well, the biggest thing we can do to reduce power prices is to get more gas into the market because that is now setting the price of electricity as 10 coal-fired power stations have closed over the last five to six years. So the Prime Minister took the leadership there and intervened in the gas market and we have now seen uh, the big LNG suppliers offer Australian customers gas first before it's exported overseas. And the ACCC have said that gas prices have come down by up to 50%. Now, the long-term solution for that is for the states who own the resources under the, the ground, not the federal government, to overturn their moratoriums and bans on development and adopt a scientific evidence-based approach. That will help. Other components of the energy bill are networks, that's the poles and the wires, that's about 50% of your bill, would pass legislation, which if it had been done previously would have saved consumers $6.5 billion, done other work with the retailers. You point to the National Energy Guarantee, that will be a long-lasting solution in this country to integrating energy and climate policy and hopefully will overcome the partisanship we've seen uh, dog the uh, federal parliament over the last decade. So things are being done and obviously affordability is our number one priority. I was going to go back to our questioner uh, quickly, Andrew McCauley. Um, SMEs, by the way, small, medium enterprise, just, to, just for the people who didn't know what uh, that Thank acronym you, meant. Um, but... Um, what you, from what you're saying, there must be a lot of um, manufacturers that you know of who are, are close to going to the wall with these electricity prices. Tony, the key word in my question was immediate. Yes, the, the, the only solution to 150 to 200 per cent energy price increases, and that's what industry is facing, because they're on long-term contracts, and when they hit the end of that contract, I was talking to a, to a manufacturer today who immediately looked at a 200% increase in his electricity prices, his gas prices are through the roof. The only way he can deal with that is to lower his labour inputs. So you're say, you are essentially saying it's an emergency? It's a crisis right now. We're seeing, we're seeing a reduction in, in employment in manufacturing in Australia as we speak. It's already here. And that's why I ask, what can we do immediately? OK, so one more question for you. You heard what the Minister said. He's laid out a plan. Mm. Um, you think it'll take years for that plan to take effect. What do you say now to Josh Frydenberg? And I'll come back to him. Well, the question is, what immediate relief can be provided? And we're talking about offsets for, for energy increases. We're talking about methods of, of industry sustaining uh, production and employment when they're seeing price shocks that 
we haven't seen in this country really since the you know the 1970s and the energy price, petrol fuel price shocks back then. It's it, the only way that that production can be continued is to move it offshore, and we're already seeing that. Um, the demand for print and packaging, packaging is one of the largest, the, the fastest growing sectors in our economy, but it can be moved offshore. Okay, well. Josh Reinberg, you're going to lose jobs offshore. They're saying manufacturing will close down unless you do something immediately. What are you going to do? Well, the answer is um, that we are taking action now and there is no silver bullet. You have to deal with every aspect of the supply chain when it comes to energy. One of the things that we can also do is bring more generation on and there are now a significant commitment, whether it's in gas, whether it's in renewables, that's been the focus. Uh, there's even uh, a, uh, an energy company that's upgrading its coal-fired power plant. We need to get more generation into the market as quickly as possible. But what's been missing in Australia has been certainty at the policy level. And when you are a business that is seeking to make a 20, 30, 40 year bet by building a power plant, you need to have long-term certainty. So that's why we went out to the experts, uh, the independent experts, the Energy Security Board. We said, give us your best plan. They came back with the, Ener uh, the National Energy Guarantee. It's been widely supported by the biggest employers like you in the country, the Blue Scopes, the BHP, the Rio Tintos, the Dow Chemicals, people who take risks every day in employing people. They've got behind it. And I'd say to Chris, it's important that Labor does because we need a bipartisan approach to give investors the certainty. OK, well, let's, let's hear from uh, Labor now. <clears throat> well, Josh is 100% right to say the biggest challenge is policy certainty. But the problem is the Liberal Party's been in office for five years and we still don't have policy certainty and we've had massive changes in policy. And trying to strike a bipartisan agreement with the government is very difficult when Josh can't get his preferred policy through his own party room, <laughs> let alone uh, through us. Now, I think Josh and Mark Butler and me and Scott Morrison could sit down very fairly easily and agree a bipartisan energy policy. But Josh wouldn't be able to get it through the Liberal Party room and the climate change deniers that he's got to deal with. I feel sorry for Josh having to deal with them, but he's, the fact of the matter is you've got to deal with the Craig Kellys of the world <laughs> to get your policies through, and it's hard work. Now, um, Chris, what about the... We're hearing here about an emergency situation absolutely. that needs to be dealt with as an emergency yeah, absolutely, situation, but... according to those people... And he's representing a lot of people who are about to close down by what he's saying. I, I, I understand that completely, and that's 100% right. But I am saying Josh is right to point to policy certainty, however. It's just that we haven't been provided with any. And Josh is also right to point to gas as an immediate challenge and opportunity. We went to the last election promising a national interest test on gas exports, a type of gas reservation policy. Josh said it would be the end of the world and was massive intervention and terrible protectionism and now he's adopted it. Um, but if it oh. should have been adopted way back then, it should have been adopted way back then, uh, the, the government has seen this, you know, should have known this problem was coming. They were warned uh, very early about uh, the gas shortages that were going to hit us and gas shortages are leading to massive uh, increases in energy bills for manufacturers, you know, Viridian, the glass, Australia's last glass manufacturer in, uh, in Dandenong. I mean, massive increases in their bills. I don't know how they're going to possibly uh, get through it. And it is gas, uh, which is the most immediate thing which can be done. And again, you know, if there's sensible things that we can help the government do, we're more than happy but to Chris, do that. But Chris, you know that in your... I mean, because you brought it up, I'll bring it up. But in your 2012 Energy White Paper and in written advice from the Australian Energy Market Operator, when you were in government, you were told about the import Im impact on supply demand of having a big export yeah. industry. Uh, and now we're paying the price. You've been in okay, can, I, can I just say, I think what we're doing now, we're hearing a kind of political bickering, but well, no, neither of you have actually right. said there ought to be an emergency plan to save these well, jobs. No, what, or to save these... Factories. I just want to quickly hear once more from Andrew what you've heard <coughs> from both the politicians. Does it give you any comfort? No, it doesn't. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm sorry. I know both of you are trying to find a solution, but the reality is we're talking about employment today. We're talking about investment in industry today. Um, policy from, from all governments, state and federal, has created sovereign risk in Australia, which gets directly to the issue of investment. Uh, it's an issue in, in energy production. It's an issue in investment in high technology, which goes into manufacturing. And we need to know what the solution to it is immediately because the easiest solution for capital is to move offshore. OK, I'm going to broaden this out because I've got another question on this, and it's the consumer side of it, really, because households are struggling uh, with electricity prices. Paul Barrett 
has a question for us. Paul? Mr. Frydenberg, what are you doing to ensure Australian electricity prices are affordable, internationally competitive, and that all of Australia has enough reliable electricity? Well, I'm glad you mentioned reliability because what we have seen particularly play out in South Australia has been huge volatility in supply. Well, it's the reality. It's not. And, um, it's a complete furphy. Well, OK. South Australia has the highest prices no, and don't. the least reliable um, uh, system in the country. And the volatility comes from having a lack of storage. And so what we have done through the National Energy Guarantee is create a new obligation on the energy retailers that a certain amount of their supply of power is available on demand, irrespective of the weather, but on demand. Now, that could be everything from traditional fossil fuels, like coal and gas, to wind and solar, as long as there's backup power, to what is now termed demand response, where companies are paid if it's in their interest to reduce their demand at peak times. It's that level of innovation that the Australian energy market operator is working on, and it is what we need to overcome the unreliability in the system. That will reduce power prices together with the National Energy Guarantee, which shows through independent modelling, modelling by a group that was used previously by the Labor Party, would leave the average household $300 a year better off than under their plan, and wholesale prices, which are used by big companies, down by 23%. So if you're a supermarket, that's a $400,000 a year reduction in your power bill. If you're a chemical manufacturer, that's a million dollars down in your power bill. OK, Joe, now I'm going to hear from both sides of politics, but I want to hear from the other panellists as well because electricity prices are hitting everybody. Mm. Well, I'll be very brief and say renewable energy is not the culprit here and it is just pure partisan crass politics to pretend that they are. Mm. Renewable energy... <laughs> So you're energy. saying South Australia's Has... got a great system? Well, South Australia's Sorry. invested heavily in renewable energy, and you used to believe in renewable Sorry. energy, Josh, once upon a time. <laughs> it... <laughs> I mean, it, renewable energy has to be part of the solution. Has to be part of the solution. It's being, you know, but everyone says that. That sounds obvious. Well, you, but you just blamed renewable energy. There I'm was a storm in, West, in South Australia. Yeah, come on. That yeah. wasn't caused by Josh, wind farm. Um, I think he it did listen to your Josh. argument. You probably should have okay. said Yes. So... We need policy certainty, but we need more investment in renewable energy, not less. Um, storage is an issue. The South Australian government's been dealing with that uh, through their battery more than Josh has done uh, when it comes to storage. They've been, do they've been dealing they've, they've done it. It's done. Um, so let's not play politics. You know, let's not accuse South Australia of being responsible, the South Australian Labor government of being responsible for blackouts when there's a storm and blaming renewable energy. Malcolm Turnbull, once upon a time, believed in something as well. It appears the Liberal Party now just believes in whatever can get them a cheap headline to blame a state government when actually what we need is federal and state governments working together to get more investment. Uh, we do need more investment because power stations will close. That's a statement of fact. They're reaching the end of their natural, natural life. We need more investment and part of it has got to be renewable. OK. Um, Sharina, you, you were talking earlier about how ordinary people want a kind of stake in this. Ordinary people are the ones mm. paying these um, spiralling... Uh, power bills, including, obviously, manufacturers, as mm. we've just heard. Mm. I hear you because I struggle to, power, to pay my power bill. It's very expensive. I'm very cautious. We turn off the lights, everything. We are very conscious consumers. We um, make sure that the, it's, it's you know, trying to consume renewable energy as much as possible. But it's still insurmountable amount of money we're expending every single month in electricity bill. I don't have children. I'm lucky enough to, that it's myself and my cousin and we share a house and there's only two people and it's hundreds of dollars. That is a lot of money that we are having to fork out in order to keep the lights on. And I'm not, like, you know, we don't have a huge... Um, uh, place. It's a very small, it's a very humble abode in a unit and we share a block uh, with family members and they also struggle with that. And it's about how, well, no one's answered, how are we able to pay 
the rising surcharges, the rising prices in energy for the everyday Australian who don't have 80 plus thousand dollar incomes. It's expensive and no one's addressed, no one's really talking about the issues at hand, about the inaffordability. We're going, oh no, don't put the light on. <laughs> like, no, open the window, open the doors and because we're going to save energy on, in terms of not putting the air con, despite it being stifling hot for those who are lucky enough to have air con. So, like, it's, it's about affordability, it's about accessibility. I don't know how you... Uh, mitigate those the rising surcharges. I don't know how you mitigate the the lobbyists. I don't know how you mitigate like private investors who have a stakeholdership. Um, but it's certainly not evening out the playing field, and they're only going up and up and up. Simon, uh, well, um, part of the problem. I mean, Josh has talked about uh, the government needing to get involved in certain parts of the energy market. Chris has talked about the need for investment. What he means is government investment. Uh, in renewables. The reality is that renewables are costing taxpayers on both ends. They're costing you both when the government decides to put money into this technology that's never going to provide the reliability that coal and gas and other forms of electricity production can. Um, and you're also getting hit on the other end because you need to put measures like, for instance, storage in place, which then add a further cost to electricity retailers. So um, renewables already are going to receive $60 billion by 2030. Now, just to put that in context, because that's a huge number for people to try and comprehend, that would cost the, the same amount of money that we're spending on renewables between now and, to, and 2030 would build us 10 nuclear reactors. So that would solve both the cost problem and it would reduce, and it would reduce emissions. And if you're serious, and if you're serious about emissions, is this one problem? It takes nearly something... 30 years to build a nuclear reactor. Sure, so, okay, but um... I'm saying these costs. I'm, I'm saying these costs are going to run out to 2030. And and the problem at the it's moment is no we're one talking 20. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. But does any does any political party at the moment have the the solution on the table that is going to solve these problems? And Sharina, you're absolutely right to raise the issue of cost. And um, I, I've seen some people talk about the fact that well, you know, maybe maybe um, cost isn't such a problem. It's a massive problem for for those on low incomes. It's a yeah. massive, massive problem for even middle income people in Australia at the moment. And of course, as Andrew raised, it's a huge problem for manufacturers, and it's a it's a problem for for businesses outside of manufacturing as well. Um, electricity has increased over the last 10 years by 126%, and that's more than twice the rate of increase when it comes to average wages in this country. So that's why we're feeling the pinch at the moment. And neither of the, the major political parties at the moment uh, are going to tell you that prices are going to continue to increase. Under both of their plans, prices are going to continue that's not to right. increase. Sorry, Simon. OK, now, before you say anything, I want to hear from Louise, because we've heard from everyone else. No, all I would say is that um, having, you know, paid homage to the you know, um, well-meaning politicians we have with us tonight, it sort of does feel a bit dispiriting to listen to you sort of the point, political point scoring. It feels that that's what we're listening... It feels like that's what I'm hearing out of this. Um, I think there are serious and important ideological differences between the political parties. I think they're important and we need to understand more about them. I'd like to understand, you know, the differences in... Um, yeah, ideological position that you have when you argue the particular energy position you have, mm -hmm. both of you. That's what I feel like I don't hear from you. I hear a uh, point scoring. I hear kind of, well, you know, ours will be X percent, ours will be Y percent. Under us, you know... The, because you know, they're on the, a unity ticket. I don't think they're on a unity ticket at all. I think they're important ideological differences and I think they are important and I think we as citizens should be able to understand them and have access to actually what is underneath the argument that you're currently having because it feels like point scoring. Well, the, it doesn't well, feel like a genuine discussion about, you know, whether the market prevails, whether government should be intervening, and um, whatever the issues are underneath Louis, it, it feels like we don't hear Louise, the reality is you are dealing with three objectives at once. You're dealing with affordability which is critical to our international competitiveness and to households who are struggling, mm. genuinely struggling with higher energy bills. You're dealing with reliability, which is now for the first time coming into question because we've lost those base load generators, the Hazelwood in our state of Victoria, mm. and we're seeing more renewables come in without the necessary storage. That's what we have to deal with. And then the third uh, leg of this stool, the trilemma, is reducing our emissions. Just drop Now, we've all... But wait, see, we're not dropping our emissions reduction. Then costs we're, will continue no, to increase. No, but here's... No, we have signed up to Paris 
And when we, as an Australia, sign up to a deal, we stick to it. Josh Paris, and if no, every no, but, country no, but, signed but, up but, to Paris. But, but here's Simon. Here we, now, our job is to do that at the least possible cost. But the public think that if the wind blows and the sun shines, it's free. It's not. There is a cost to this transition which has to be managed. And I don't think the politicians have helped ourselves with the argy-bargy over the last decade. That's why we need a bipartisan approach. That's why we went okay. to the experts. I'm just going to give Chris uh, 20 seconds because yeah. we've got to move on to other well, It goes back to my original point. I don't think you will hear the ideological differences between Josh and I because I actually don't think there are any. Oh. I think the problem is... As I, but I said, as, as I said, the government commissioned the chief scientist and the chief scientist recommended an energy intensity yep. scheme. We said, yep, we'll sign up to that. It's not our preferred policy. It's not exactly how we would do it, but the policy certainty is so important. The trouble is Josh couldn't get it through his party room. It's not true. Well, you couldn't, Josh. You, you had a commitment. You had a, a recommendation from the chief scientist. You rejected it because the reason. hard right of the Liberal Party told you to. And as I said, I think... Glad you believe I think Mark Butler and Josh could sit down and agree a bipartisan policy quite, quite sensibly and quite quickly. Mark could get it through our party room. Josh couldn't get it through his. That's the problem. OK, we're going to leave it there because we are definitely going to come back to Josh this issue it. in other Josh programs. Josh uh, Move on to other subjects. The uh, next question is from Mick Scarcella. Malcolm Turnbull disrespected Clinton Pryor, who walked across the country for a year to discuss Indigenous issues. He dismissed the Uluru Statement from the Heart and just last week snubbed the Stolen Generation's apology breakfast in Canberra. He has since threatened the Labor Party with taking Indigenous issues to the next election in a game of political football. Is this a sign of a leader who sincerely wants to close the gap on Indigenous disadvantage or holding his colonial foothold on the throat of the oppressed Indigenous population, which has been the case for 230 years? Sharina, I'll start with you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, brother, for your question. The gap report shows that Indigenous men will die 10.6 years less than their non-Indigenous counterparts. I, as an Indigenous woman, have the odds already stacked against me. I'm 9.5 years less life expectancy than my non-Indigenous counterparts. This Close the Gap initiative, which was meant to bridge, close the disparity in terms of Indigenous health, welfare and education has only broadened. Six out of the seven targets have only been met. Six. That is not good enough. Malcolm Turnbull walked out of the Close the Gap report, walked out of the Uluru Statement from the heart. When do Indigenous people get a social, cultural and economic empowerment and voice in Parliament? We're asking to deconstruct the systems that exist. We're asking to be invited to the table. The Indigenous advisory body wouldn't hold any political sway whatsoever. It's an advisory body for members of parliament who are already in a position to influence the parliamentary decisions. Now, I am really tired of non-Indigenous members in parliament, like the Nick Scullions, who actually didn't put it to vote who didn't bother to poll it because their instincts told them that it wouldn't work. So I don't know how you bridge the gap in child mortality. I don't know how you bridge the gap in terms of Aboriginal people are still struggling to have a voice. We are the sovereign owners of this country. I am a Wongatha Yamaji Noongar Gidja. We have never ceded sovereignty. I am tired of begging and asking for our humanity. When is it enough? My mother, at 31, went back to law school. I'll tell you about closing the gap because it's coming from Indigenous peoples, not from initiatives created in Parliament as an Aboriginal woman, went back and became the first Indigenous female state prosecutor in Western Australia. I'm a daughter of five girls. Every single one of us have, is in university. My sister is in medicine at the moment. My two younger sisters are about to graduate. 
My second young, my twin sister is a, as a university graduate. I have qualified through university. I'm about to go into my honours at Curtin University. So in terms of closing this gap and this healing that they want to create, there is no healing going on. When you apologise, you do not do it again. The thing is with the stolen generations is that we are still having Aboriginal children forcibly removed from their homes without consultation from their parent or guardian and going straight into the system. Aboriginal people are still denied the basic human rights in accordance to the UN Declaration for human, uh, Indigenous Rights for, Aboriginal, for Aboriginal people. The fact that the UN have absolutely slammed Australia in terms of its treatment of Aboriginal people is a disgrace. Sharina, I'm going to... I'm so, going to, in terms of answering your... I just want to put... I'll just put something to you as a question. Yeah. yeah. So, in terms so of... So, the, the question was talking about uh, Malcolm Turnbull's engagement. It's, it's you, about you, parliamentary engagement. Do you think, it's it's about, do you think uh, it goes to leadership, though? Absolutely. <clears throat> I want Aboriginal people... We've got the incredible Patrick Dodson, Senator Patrick Dodson, in, in positions of power. We've got the Le Linda Burnies. We've got incredible bodies of people who are willing to speak up and be a in voice life. for our people. And we're wanting to be included into the, into the conversation. And what we, as Aboriginal people, we are deconstructing the systems, the power systems that exist. So, yes, whether you're Liberal or Labor, it's, whether you're Greens, whether you uh, don't have a poli strong political position, Aboriginal people sh still should be at the forefront in terms of your decision-making processes. And I'm tired that we still get denied that basic human right. And what you're talking about is absolutely imperative and, and interconnected to the policies and procedures that we have had to live through, survive, resist, deconstruct and challenge for the last 230 years. So okay. I don't know when. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to put some of this. I know, I know, but some I don't know when Go ahead. <laughs> Not to you. It's about the systems. It's yep. about the power systems that exist. Mm. So I don't know. How, I, I don't know how. Which are failing us. They are failing us dismally. The fact that Malcolm Turnbull is a byproduct of Tony Abbott, who cut half a billion dollars in his first budget half a billion dollars from programs and, and infrastructure and, and, and resources to Aboriginal Australia just is indicative about what this government thinks about Aboriginal OK, Australia. Sharina, I'm going to have to put some of this to... <laughs> Josh is here representing the government. But, you know, there's a, the, the core part of that question, yeah. there, were, was, there were a number of things, but obviously one of the things was the rejection of the... Uluru uh, Memorandum and particularly the idea of having a representative body to advise the parliament outside of the parliament. Why was that rejected out of hand? Because Australians have equal rights, equal rights to vote, equal rights to sit in the parliament <laughs> and equal rights to serve. And, and no, Aboriginal people did not have equal rights until we... My mother was born in 1965, mm. and she was not considered a human being until the referendum came through to the Foreign Front yes. Iraq in 1967. And you know who, so, no, and, and you, the equal rights are not even. And you know who led that charge? Was Harold Holt, who reached across the divide to Gough Whitlam. My point is this, right? Having equal rights to sit in the parliament is inconsistent with the principle of a third chamber. There's no third now, chamber. Oh, it, is, it, is, it is a third chamber. Now, the issues you raise about closing the gap are legitimate. We have to do better. There is no shortage of goodwill um, and there's been huge amounts of money spent. But if you talked about infant mortality, um, we've got a long way to go, but we have fallen in infant mortality in Indigenous communities by 35% since 1990. OK, Josh, I'm just going to bring you down to one point because you yeah. said it's a third chamber. It Everyone is in the Indigenous community says it's not. Well, it's The people who designed it say it's not. Why do you say it is? Because it's going to be entrenched in the Constitution, it will be elected representatives and it will be advising the Parliament I'd on like issues it. that relate to Indigenous people. Now, that is everything. That is social welfare, that is defence, that is health, that is education. But, but Josh, what's wrong with advice? 
Yes. Be because we, as government, seek out advice in everything we do. That's why we have a professional public service. Josh, you do not still seek out the advice of Aboriginal people. You still do not consult Aboriginal people. And it's Constitutional it's reform is about empowering that voice. It's not about creating a third chamber in the Cabinet. It's not about special privileges for Aboriginal people. It's about allocating and ascending Aboriginal Australia to where your own party is at. OK, let's hear from the other panellists. Louise. All I wanted to say was that um, you say you seek out advice. Shireen, as the, you know, the Uluru Statement is actually providing you with the opportunity to get yes. the advice. It seems so obvious to me. OK, Chris Bowen, because uh, the Labor Party obviously has committed to doing this. Yes. In rejecting the Uluru Statement, Malcolm Turnbull may well go down as the Prime Minister who broke the nation's heart. This is... This, we had a unique opportunity and I fear it's passed. Everybody says they agree with Indigenous recognition in the Constitution, and we, yet we can't do it. Now, the Indigenous community quite rightly says we don't want it to be symbolic. We don't, just don't want to be mentioned in the Constitution just in passing. We want real change. Mm -hmm. And I want to pay... I actually want to pay credit to some constitutional conservatives who you would expect to reject this, mm. uh, people like Professor Greg Craven, who's put a lot of thought into what might work and have written a book about it, The Forgotten People. Uh, about what might work. Now, it is not a third chamber of parliament. I'm sorry, Josh, it is fundamentally dishonest to call it a third chamber of That's parliament. Not true. It would not have power of veto over any policy. It would not be deliberative over policy. It would be advisory. And I think, I think, I for one, as the alternative treasurer, have no problem with getting that advice and I have no problem with it being enshrined in the constitution. And we've said we'd legislate it as a first step because we, we, we won't get it uh, into the Constitution and listen until it becomes bipartisan. But as a first step, if we're elected, at least we will legislate an advisory group. But, look, we have, we have spent time on marriage equality through a plebiscite, which the Parliament could have done. We spent time on all these issues. We could have spent this time on Indigenous recognition. We could have done it for the yes. 50th anniversary of that most important referendum in the same spirit of the 1967 yes. referendum. Yes. We could have done it on the 50th anniversary. We lost that opportunity because of a lack of political leadership. And Malcolm Turnbull standing at the dispatch box last week and goading us and saying, if you go down this road, I'll make this an election issue, was nothing short of disgusting. Well, Warren Mundine, your own president of the Labor Party... It's been a long time since no, he's been your own Labor Party. Long he time said since the Labor Party. that this idea, the voice, was a solution looking for a problem. Well, I, don't think, I don't think Australia's Can indigenous people... Can you stop? I'm really it. tired of non-Indigenous peoples making commentaries about Indigenous Australia because Warren we've Monday. spent two... Yourself included. We have spent 230 years... 230 years of not being included in this Constitution. We share sovereignty with the Crown. The Queen still owns some of our traditional lands. We're still begging to protect sacred sites that are over 80,000 years old from mining companies, from gas companies. We want to be the author of our own destinies. We want to be the voice because we are tired of non-Indigenous Australia thinking they know what is good for us and thinking that they can be the voice for Aboriginal Australia. So they should all learn to keep their mouth shut and start engaging Aboriginal Australia into the conversation. OK. I think that sort of effectively did draw a line out of that conversation. So we'll yes. move on uh, to another question on a different subject from Nicholas Richter. This question goes to Mr Frydenberg. The Coalition wish to impose a big cut in corporate tax rates. As investigations done by the ABC have shown that only one in five <laughs> big companies have paid no tax in the last three years, how can the Coalition justify their unequivocal faith in trickle-down economics when wages in Australia are growing at the lowest rate compared to global partners. There's lots of parts to that question. The first thing, obviously, is you refer to the ABC uh, so-called analysis. Well, I understand that that article has been pulled because it didn't meet the editorial guidelines for balance. That's a question for the ABC. 
um, the, the opinion piece was pulled, the factual piece. But the analysis still the remains. So the factual piece <laughs> is what contained the facts. The so called analysis has been pulled. Now, the issue of company tax is about jobs. If you look at Australia's company tax rate, it's 30%. If you look at the United States, they're now going to 21%. If you look at the United Kingdom, they're at 19 going to 17, and in Singapore and Hong Kong and New Zealand, they're lower than Australia. Chris published a book. He said, quote, it was the Labor thing to reduce company tax, to, redu to, to drive jobs, growth and investment. It's because if you free up these companies to invest, they will do so in, in jobs. And we have to compete. Where's the evidence? Where is the evidence? Well, facts, that facts. Show, well, yes. Wages will rise. Yes. Innovation will proceed. Profits will trickle down. Show us the so, evidence. Give us one instance so, in which that's happened. Well, the fact is... Other than the, dividends to shareholders. No, the fact every, is... Every the, yes, the yes, Louis, yes. I thought you were on the centre-left. I didn't know you were a socialist. Look, the point is... The point is... We wear we, it with pride. With Don't point, be ashamed. The point is... <laughs> the point is... <laughs> <laughs> All right. Keep going, Josh. OK. Australia, Australia <laughs> will be left behind. And our companies, these big companies that employ... Nine out of ten people in Australia are employed in the private sector. If we don't compete with the rest of the world, jobs will go elsewhere. They can set up in Singapore. They can set up in the United States. We talk about energy. You can get gas prices at a third of what you can get in Australia, in the United States, because of the shale gas revolution. That's the reality. Paper manufacturers will go there if it's a combination of tax and energy prices and labour costs. So we do have to remain competitive. That's why we're doing it. And not only have we... Uh, uh, funded these tax cuts within our budget parameters, we will get back uh, to balance and to um, well, Just two quick things. A reality check, uh, you're not going to get the corporate tax cuts through the Senate, so what happens then? Well, obviously it is our policy, it remains our policy, and we'll continue to make that argument to Election Day. OK, Chris Bowen. Well, I mean, the government lectures everybody about the need for budget repair. The cost of the corporate tax cuts is much bigger than anything I'll take to the next election or propose. $65 billion over the next decade. I can tell you I'm not going to take anything to the next election that's that expensive. That's not expenditure, though. Well, it's, it's still $65 billion less on the budget. I mean, that's, that's well, just... Well, you've already way, spent it. So way, you and, and, Josh, you haven't paid for it. You said you paid for it. I mean, I'd like you to explain how you're paying for it, because it hasn't. It's completely unfunded. And the fact of the matter is... It's not expenditure. It, it's what no, about the it's flow a... on to wages? Because that was a core well, part of the question. The people out there have been struggling absolutely. with stagnant wages for a very long time. That's what that questioner wants to know. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a very legitimate question. We're seeing penalty rates being cut and real wages uh, growth very, very low. But it's a $65 billion punt. And, you know, the government will say, oh, look, it's worked in America. A tiny proportion of workers in America have got a, ta a, a wage rise. <laughs> Walmart's increased the minimum wage to the princely sum of $11 an hour at the same time as sacking workers. They don't blame the tax cut for sacking workers, thousands of workers. They, they claim that the tax cut has led to wages growth. It's a... I tell you what, the better way to uh, stop wages going backwards is to stop the penalty rate cut, not spend $65 billion on a corporate tax cut and just hope that it flows through. Just hope that it flows through. Now, there's plenty of things that can be done, but just that, just hope that it works, $65 billion is not the best way, and it is the biggest single hit to the budget, which either side will take to the next election. OK, we just ran over time, so our budget oh. for... Q&A is all <laughs> over for tonight. We can't go into deficit. Please thank our panel, Louise Adler, Josh Frydenberg, Sharina Clanton, Simon Breeny and Chris Bowen. <clears throat> now, remember, you can continue the discussion with Q&A Extra on News Radio and Facebook Live, where Scott Wales is joined by the Conversations... Uh, Lucinda Beeman. Now, next Monday on Q&A, the Assistant Minister for Science, Jobs and Innovation, Zed Seselja. The Shadow Minister for Justice, Claire O'Neill. Philosopher and author, A.C. Grayling. Former Deputy Leader of the British Labor Party, Harriet Harman. And writer, broadcaster and visiting fellow at the Strategic Policy Institute, Catherine McGregor. Until next week's Q&A, good night.